morning, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to <clears throat> Claysburg Bible Church. I'll try and uh, don't know what it is this morning. Seems like Sunday mornings when I have to speak, the, something comes to reside in my throat. So, <clears throat> drink a little <clears throat> diet tea. See if that helps get it going. Bet. <clears throat> I won't give the devil the credit, but he always is hanging around, you know, so. <coughs> we will be in Romans 8 in the middle of our message this morning. You see the, you hear the titles to my messages today, today, this morning, and tonight. You might want to leave. Going to talk about anxiety. Uh morning's message is called separation anxiety I know all you parents who are about to send your kids off to back to school you're probably going to have separation anxiety right some of you maybe not <coughs> uh, kids say summer goes so fast parents say this boy that summer was a long one and uh, but anyhow <coughs> talk about separation anxiety and I had Adam read that middle that uh, portion of scripture because we read in there what can separate us from the love of Christ and the answer is nothing however there comes time when we do have some anxiety uh, before I uh, get going I Learned something from last Sunday night, Pastor Lynn Johnson filled in, and he said, I always tell a preacher joke. He said, since I'm retired as a preacher, I tell a preacher joke. I wanted to ask him why he waited until he retired, but anyhow. Uh, so, you know, curious minds want to know, right? So I looked up online some preacher jokes, and here's one I hope doesn't happen this morning, but there was a... Uh, <coughs> visiting elderly fellow at a church and the pastor said at the end of the the meeting tonight there'll be a board meeting in the little room off of the lobby all the board members port, report there he gets there and here's this elderly visiting gentleman and he said sir I'm sorry you must have misunderstood this is just for those on the board he said if anybody's more bored than I I don't know who it is so that's, uh, my prayer is that none of you will be in a board meeting at the end of this service. But <clears throat> how I came up with this message is, uh, any of you ever preached or spoke in front of a crowd, uh, sometimes the Lord leads you uh, to, a, to a message in a, in a strange way. And... Uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago now, uh, we went to the Bedford Fair to see some of our friends show cattle. Uh, I wouldn't say the high girls, but I guess I already did. But, uh, and, uh, and uh, well, all three of the girls did a little show in at the fair. And we were there on Monday night to see their showman, the showmanship class classes and little Anna has a brown Swiss. Now all of you know in here I love brown Swiss cattle. I was raised around them. I showed them as a kid. Uh, I want to buy one. My wife hasn't given me that opportunity yet. Uh, I have a picture of one on the front of my truck. So I'm, I'm a brown Swiss lover. But little Anna has a brown Swiss and and that evening her heifer was just not behaving at all in the ring. I pitied Anna, I have pictures of her. She, she was practically wrestling the halter on that calf, on that heifer, pretty good sized heifer now. Here, uh, what was going on was her pen mate at home, the, the other calf that she was raised with from little up was still in the barn. She was in a different class. And both of those animals missed each other this brown Swiss so badly that when we had done, Gary stood out there and held, it, held her, and she was just fussed all up. 
In fact, you could hear them communicating back and forth. One in the show ring, it was the brown Swiss was bawling, and the, the Holstein, the black and white in the barn was bawling, and they were, they, were, they were missing each other. And I'm sure if Gary would have just left go of the holder, that heifer would have went right in beside her, her pen mate. When Gary did take her in the barn, she right in beside, and I stand there watching, and they rubbed their heads together, those two cows, just like your back. Later in the week, we went out to uh, one of our friends that live up there in Queen area. Their daughter shows horses, and we went out to see her horses. And we found the horse barn. Of course, you know at the fair, every horse has its own separate pen. Well, we get to see where Christie's two horses were, and there's one pen's empty, and both of her horses are in the same pen. And I said to my wife, well, maybe she's out. Maybe she's going to clean the pen. We'll just wait here a little bit. And we waited, and uh, she, didn't, she didn't come around. So we later found out from her mother, her horses was having the same thing as the girls' as calves were having. They had separation anxiety. Although they were side by side in the pen, they could not see each other. And uh, Christy's mom told me the one just pawed on the wall and tried to climb the wall because she couldn't see her friend. So I got thinking about that, and I got thinking about how those, it was really apparent that night with those, those heifers and, and with the horses that it affected them. It affected those animals. We all, and, and perhaps we have that too in our lives. I remember talking about school. I remember taking our first daughter our firstborn daughter, April, to college and down to Millersville, and we dropped her off in the, we did all the, you know, right things, fixed her room up, met her roommate, and so on and so forth. Time to come home, we dropped her off. She came out to the, to the uh, parking lot where the van was and said our goodbyes, and we would drove around the parking lot, and of course, uh, I'll say mother, but dad too, was having a rough time. And I think we circled that parking lot three times and said goodbye. Today, this morning, I'm going to talk about separation, three, three classes or three places in a crowd this size. We can, I know <coughs> there's those represented perhaps in each of these classes. <clears throat> separation from God as a sinner. <clears throat> if there's somebody here this morning and you're not, never come to Christ as your Savior, <clears throat> excuse me, you're separated from God. And we're going to see from the Scriptures <clears throat> the dire spot that you're in. Next. <clears throat> <clears throat> separation from God <clears throat> as a believer. And you might say, I thought we just read, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, I thought we just read in Romans 8 that there is no separation as a believer. <clears throat> We're going to look into that a little deeper. And then, <clears throat> this one has really struck me in, in relation with the story I told you at the beginning. <clears throat> Separation from each other as believers. It hasn't been too many years ago that we experienced that as a church, didn't we? <clears throat> I understand that there are some moves in the government ranks <clears throat> to start some some of the uh, separation procedures again. <clears throat> but when COVID hit and the pandemic, one of the things they wanted to do, shut down the churches. <clears throat> and we did here for a little bit, and I've said it from the platform and I'll say it again. <clears throat> I was the one who thought maybe it's a good idea. And we did, but I, I rethought that since then. 
<clears throat> it's never a good idea to separate God's people. I think somebody's offering me a, a halls here. That might help. Thank you. <clears throat> it's never a good idea to be on an island as a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I don't know if any, anybody else in here watches football or follows football, but I kind of do, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's getting wound up again. Uh, the <clears throat> coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers, Mike Tomlin, I watched a little skit of his this week. <clears throat> Somebody asked him, boy, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Somebody asked him, <clears throat> well, now how are you getting water? Anybody have a stretcher? <clears throat> I couldn't say no to that last one. <clears throat> Tells me maybe the devil doesn't want me to tell, have this message this morning. <clears throat> <clears throat> but Mike Tomlin said this. Somebody asked him, how do you motivate your people? He, he gave three sayings on the little skit that I've seen. Number one, there's two dogs and one bone. Number two, the routine done routinely. And number three, the boy has to die so the man can live. And in those three motivational sayings, there's, they kind of link with the three sections of study that we have this morning. First of all, separation from God is a sinner. When I think of a, a, a soul that isn't saved, I picture immediately in my mind a battle that's going on for that soul. I think the nonsense that we see in this world is in particular to keep souls from coming to Christ. The devil doesn't care how you get to hell. He just cares that you get there. Kind of relates with that first saying that Mike Tomlin gave, two dogs and one bone. There's a tug of war. There's a, a battle for your soul. If you're here this morning or watching on line, if you're not saved, there's a battle going on for your soul. That battle is between God himself and Satan. If you're not saved, you should have separation anxiety. Our world today makes everybody feel so comfortable. I seen something this week. I don't have it in my notes. That's why my message is getting long. But seen something this week on, on the news. Believe me, I don't watch much news. And I remove anything hard from around me because I'd be throwing it through the TV. But in California, surprise, surprise, uh, they removed one of the mascots because he was a Minuteman. And it offended the children that that Minuteman held a gun. And the, the one lady commentator, uh, when they asked her opinion on it, she, she took and she had her bare arm. She went, ouchie, ouchie, you hurt me. She said, that's the society we're living in today. Everybody to be made comfortable Who's behind that? That's Satan. Turn with me you're, if you're in Romans 8. Just flip back to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. 
I asked this question, what separate us, separates us from God when we are physically born? I'll, I'll sum that up in one word, sin, S-I-N. I have a question on my sheet. What is the middle letter of sin? I always teach this to the kids downstairs. They spell it out S-I-I. And usually they, if, if you have 18, all 18 says I at a different time. You know, I, I. And that's the point. What is sin? It's I. I heard a man saying one time about another gentleman that he said he has eye problems. And I said, oh, I didn't know his eyes were bad. He said, no, no, eye problems. We all... How many of you ever had to, if you have children, ever had to teach your child to say, mine, mine, or to want the toy that the other child has? Or to say, I, I, none of us have to be taught that. It's, we're born into a sinful nature, with a sinful nature, and that's the only, it's only manifesting when we do that. Romans 5, verse 12 says this, Therefore, as by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Because of the sin of Adam, and uh, we've just been through that in our junior church, Adam and Eve, and the sin of Adam, taken of forbidden fruit, because of that sin, it's been passed to all of us. We all uh, might say, boy, I want, my, I want what's, you've heard this term too, I want what's coming to me. Be careful. If we all get what's coming to us, it'd be a lost eternity. Romans 6.23, if you want to flip there, we can flip to that, but it's a common verse or a familiar verse. It says this, for the wages of sin is death. We're going to stop there for just a minute. The wages of sin is death. <clears throat> death spoken of here is separation from God. So being born into this world and remaining the same till you go from this world in death you would be forever separated from God the good news the cure for this separation anxiety for you if you're a sinner not saved is the second part of this verse <clears throat> but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord <clears throat> We we're reading about the love of God. Adam read that to us. And God had manifested that love in the giving of his son, Jesus Christ. As he came into this world to go to the cross, to be crucified, to bear our sins in his own body on that tree, to die and to be buried and to rose, raise again the third day. That's the gospel. That's the good news. John 3.36, and you don't need to turn there, I'll read it to you. says this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. Now notice this last part. But the wrath of God abideth or remains on him. I have in big bold letters on my notes, even now. So the first part of this message, separation from God as a sinner, is apparent from Scripture. Another ploy of the devil today that we see and hear all around us just drives me up a wall. Everybody that dies goes to heaven. Have you seen that? Heard that? I would like to believe that, but it's not the truth. 
Why is that such a convenient message for the devil? Because it tells people just live any way you want, and when you, you die, you're just going to be ushered into the presence of God. And remember what I said earlier? The devil doesn't care how you get to hell. It just, he just cares that you do get there. So there's a battle. There's a battle for the soul of the unsaved. And I reiterate what I said earlier. If you're unsaved and you're in the sound of my voice, whether it be here in the room, in the overflow, by uh, online, however it is, maybe you get a CD later. If you're unsaved, you should have separation anxiety. I pray this morning, if you're hearing my voice here in this room or in the overflow, you will have that anxiety until you come to Christ. It's called conviction. We don't hear much of that in our world today. The Spirit of God takes the Word of God and convicts till that person makes a choice. We do have a choice. I believe everyone who ends up in the lake of fire will have no excuse. None. If they did, if just one person did, God would not be a just God. And our verse, the last verse I read, the defining line is whether one believes on the Son of, Son of God, Jesus, or whether they believe not on Him. Second part of our message, separation from God as a, I had saint to match the S for sinner, but I thought some might not understand, as a believer. And you might say, uh, in these verses we read, well, I'm never separated. And it is true. Uh, I think of Mike Tomlin saying, the boy has to die so the man can live. How many of you uh, look back on your young life? Now, some of you are young, and you won't be doing that just yet. But those of us who are older, how many of you look back on your young life? I do it all the time, talk to my brothers, and I say, man, how stupid that was. <laughs> I heard an amen, so more than just me. Or I look back, and I see the grace of God just littered throughout my life. My dad is gone now, so I can tell this story, or, or I would probably be in trouble even yet. We had an old farm truck, 1965 Ford. Bought it brand new at Stucky Ford, or Beasley's, that's right. Be Beasley's long gone now. But. And uh, it got used quite hard on the farm. We used to go up from my dad's farm to my uncle's sawmill to get sawdust to bed to put under the cows at night. So, And we'd load that thing up. Depended. If my uncle was there with his loader and he could really load it up, us boys, we just got enough to last for a day or two because we liked to take the truck out. But I remember taking that old truck loaded with sawdust and if anybody ever been Blue Knob, we call it Church House Hill. There's a church on, on the hill. And that truck wouldn't run very good on the flat, but boy, you get her on that hill coming down the hill, you could really leave her go. And I remember, I don't remember how fast, how far that speed armor went, but I remember that thing bouncing off the top end of it. Full of sawdust, front, you know, 65 Ford, big old steering wheel, and that thing was as loose as could be, you know. And I said to my brother not long ago, you know, we could have we could have wrecked and been down, still rolling in those fields up there. But the same thing happens in a in a spiritual sense too. When we when I was first saved, I was six years old. I was young. Come to know the Lord, and but the very I, I remember those early days vividly. I didn't, you know, I could hardly read. 
And I, I, I loved the, I loved the word. I, I loved to hear Bible stories. And the first thing I did, I wrote a little note to my five, four older brothers. You know how you wrote a note to a little girl in school, do you like me, yes or no? And if it was no, it, you just didn't show it to any of your friends, you know? I wrote to my brothers, I got saved last night, are you saved, yes or no? I think one of them said they still have that note. My concern as a new little Christian was that my brothers were saved too. I have to confess, uh, in my walk with the Lord, I haven't always been that concerned for souls. I want to ask you to turn to it, the cure for this separation from God, and we'll look here a little more as a believer, walking away from Him, is in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Remember the Mike Tomlin saying, the boy has to die so the man can live? Paul said to the Corinthian saints, pretty much I'm paraphrasing, put away childish things. Grow up. Grow up as a believer. He said, I desire to give you meat of the word, and you're not able to take it. I have a saying. Sometimes uh, I see people, when they come for a while to church or to another church, and then they stop going, and my wife will say, I wonder what happened to them. And I say, spiritual indigestion. If you ever come to church, and our pastor's a lot deeper teacher than I am, if you ever come to church and you think, boy, I don't know about what I heard this morning, go home and digest it. Ask the Holy Spirit to give, give it to you. Our verses in Romans chapter 8, uh, you can turn there. And there was a whole list of things that we had in that, as Adam was reading that, I thought, boy, this sounds like our world today. Romans 8, but one verse that really struck out, stuck out to me as Adam read it was verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, in verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of, the, of our body. We live in a groaning world, brothers and sisters. It don't matter where you turn, what you turn to, what you listen to, what you look at, there's somebody groaning. The whole creation is groaning. But then the next verse that Adam read struck me. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Have any of you ever groaned within yourself this week by seeing the things of this world? I'm going to say something. I hope it's, I say it right. But the injustice that I see in this world makes me just, infuriated what is right is wrong and what is wrong is right I think that's part of the travail and the groaning now let me say this to you you want to you want to uh, meter where your walk is with your Lord how much do you groan when you see the things of this world If it doesn't bother you, if it doesn't bother me, maybe I need to get closer to my Savior. Brother Ken Korn spoke on uh, Luke 15 last week. I was downstairs, but he 
uh, to tell him he walked with me Monday morning when I was taking my walk. I had him plugged into my ears and and uh, was listening to his message from the prodigal son. It's, a, it's an excellent example of what I'm speaking about. Now that, that portion can be used to preach the gospel uh, in, as we had in the first part. And it also can be used as that b boy left and, and left home. Did he ever become... Did he ever not be the son? No. To me, as a young believer, it was always a portion of comfort to me. But what happened? He left the convenience of that home because he thought he was overworked, underpaid. I talked to a, a local businessman just yesterday, a young fella. He said, the hardest thing I have is to try to get somebody to work for me. And he said this, they won't even come to the interview by themselves. Mom or dad has to come and answer all the questions. He said just recently I had a pers young person in there and mom answered all the questions. And at the end he said, well, you come back next uh, tomorrow because I'm not hiring mom, I'm hiring you. As I said earlier, we live in a world where everybody is placated and coddled. Even us as believers, I'm going to say something from this platform that I might regret later. I hope not. I, I probably won't because I don't plan to walk away from the Lord. But if I ever do, I want each and every one of you to come and badger me and say, Joe, where are you at in your life? Brother Elwood will know, and Dale, and some of these older ones that walk with the Lord. So that's a hard thing to do, but it's a necessary thing to do. And if you're not walking where you once did with the Lord, I heard a preacher saying years ago, and I thought he was a little off, but I, I, as I get older, I understand it. He said, if you're not as close as you once was to the Lord, you're backslidden. That strikes a chord in my heart because as I get older, I think I can just coast into shore. It doesn't work that way. So turn with me to First John, John chapter 1 to highlight this, last, this portion that we're talking. Then we'll get into the last one to sum it up here in the next 10 minutes. First John... This is written to believers, chapter 1. Verse 5 through 10, I'll read. This then is the message which we have heard of him, <clears throat> and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is not in us. This speaks of our walk with the Lord. What can hinder, uh, give us separation anxiety? We've seen from Romans 8, nothing separates us from the love of God to those of us who are in Christ Jesus. But what you all know, if you're saved, there's times when you have uh, this separation anxiety in a sense of I'm not where I should be. Well, that's the Holy Spirit it living within us, pricking our conscience and our, our convicting our hearts. This tells us that we do sin as believers, but as we, as we walk in the light, as we are in God's Word, what happens? We have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, 
his son cleanses us from all sin. And then it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Truth is not in us. You say, really, does some people believe that? Let me tell you a story. Some years ago, there were, and I won't say the town, I won't say the church, there was a preacher of a church in a nearby town, and a, a man was talking to him, and he said, uh, this preacher said, oh, I haven't sinned for years. The guy that was talking to him uh, in his country voice said, well, let me shake your hand, preacher. I never met a perfect man. This preacher is, is now gone, not on earth anymore, but he taught that. This tells us we do sin as believers. That's what separates us. That's what causes that, should cause us as in believers, that anxiety. If we, if we go on and we're having a practice in something that we know is wrong, our anxiety meter should go up. But we see in verse 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love that last verse, and sometimes we flip over that pretty quickly. If we sin and we confess that to God as believers and we're brought back into a close relationship with Him, it should and should cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, we should not go back out next week and do the same thing again. My dad used to take in, and mom used to take in a lot of people on the farm. You know, the, uh, and we had one young man came there every summer. As soon as school was out, he had to be at the farm, and he worked all summer at the farm. And he would get into mischief and do things, and uh, dad never whooped them. he done that to us, but he never whooped the visitors, but he'd give them a hard time. And he said this young, he said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Dad said, if you're really sorry, you won't turn around and do it again tomorrow. Which this boy had a habit of doing. That's what we're seeing here. A closer walk with our Savior will cleanse us from un unrighteousness. Last week you heard from Pastor Ken, when, when did that boy, what did that boy do? When did that boy find, come to himself? When he was in the pig pen, when he was down, out. But I love what Pastor Ken said, and I'll re re reiterate it today. He had to do it. He came to himself, but then he put feet to his thoughts, didn't he? I see so many people today, even believers, who say, yeah, I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't be living this way, I shouldn't be doing that, and they stay there. Confess, repent, come back to that waiting Father. I say to us all, including myself, if I'm not where I once was with my Savior, I should have separation anxiety. I want to be as close to him as I possibly can. And he has given us the Holy Spirit to live within us. There is no excuse. We're blessed. As of now, we have this book. They're going to come after it. But if they do and take it away, how much of it do you have hidden in your heart? A dear friend of mine who passed away, and she, many years ago now, but she suffered severely from Alzheimer's. She couldn't remember anything but she could quote scripture and when did she have that scripture hidden in her heart when she was a little girl the last I want to talk about and I'll sum it up with this separation from one another turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10 please Hebrews chapter 10 Really, this message kind of grew out of this part of the message when I seen uh, the high girls' cattle that night and Christie's horses acting up. I thought, 
boy, how that should be when I'm not around my brothers and sisters in Christ. What is, I'm going to ask you a, <clears throat> a blunt question today, what is the highlight of your week? You can answer that in your own heart. In Hebrews chapter 10, and we always look at verse 25, and we're going to get there, but I want you to notice a couple verses before that. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Well, I'm going to start with 19 and then get the context. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which we have consecrated for us, which he hath consecrated for us, <coughs> through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Now notice the next three verses. <clears throat> Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together <coughs> as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we s ye see the day approaching. I read uh, that whole portion for this reason. First we see Christ as our high priest. He intercedes for you and I. He's at the right hand of the Father and when I ro ro get away from the Lord he intercedes for me and he draws me back. But I like those first two words in the next three verses, let us, let us, let us. It doesn't say, let you or let me, let us. Have you ever been to, in the old days, I don't know if they still do, but they had horse pulling contests down at the farm show. Big old, uh, years ago, they used to have big old logs. Hook them to the logs and drag it through the, then they got sophisticated and got trailers and, but years ago, we showed cattle down there and one of our highlights of the week was to get to go to what's a horse pulling contest. That is, if we had all our work done, Dad would say, get your work done here and then you could go, what's a, Horse pull. And I remember this happening. One time, both horses wasn't hooked up right together. And they hooked into that sled, and they went, and nothing happened because the one horse took right off, right out of his yoke, and the other one was still standing there. Couldn't pull it by himself. Another time, the two horses uh, failed to get hooked up to the, the truck that was loaded with weight, and whenever the, the farmer gave him the go to go, what happened? Just pulled him right off the seat. There was no, no load to be pulled. That's the illustration we have here. If we do not stick together as a church, as a body of believers, the enemy will come in and conquer. We need each other. One of the, I think, one of the sad uh, results of the pandemic is that a lot of people hasn't returned back to church. We are blessed in this church. Most of you didn't stop coming, and a lot of you came back, brought your friends. But a lot of churches, that's not the case. I <laughs> Know people who say, "Why well, watch online?" It isn't the same. We're called as a unit. We're called as a body of Christ. We're called as the bride of Christ. 
Let me ask you this question. When the rapture occurs, do you want to go with your brothers and sisters? Absolutely. Why not want to be with them today? In conclusion, I say I would say this. I need you, you need me, and we all need the Lord. Notice verse 25, and then I'll ask Adam to come after I pray. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But notice this, but exhorting one another, encouraging one another. And it says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Do we see the coming of the Lord approaching? Not only the rapture that the world's going to totally miss, but even his coming as we've been talking about the kingdom in Sunday night. Pastor had been taking us through that study. His coming to this earth after the tribulation period. This week I was out beating the weeds back off of my property. You know, you have to do that every so often. Mines get so big I have to put a saw blade on my weed here because they just come from everywhere. And as I was doing that, I was thinking, what brought these weeds on? We've been teaching that to the kids downstairs, the sin. But think of that day when the Lord rules and reigns in righteousness. Think of that day when this very earth will be, we can't even describe it. I don't know what category you find yourself in this morning but there is one more and I close with this Philippians 4 6 says this be careful or anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God verse 7 and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus we don't have to have separation anxiety for a child of God, walk close to Him. I found this, the closer I walk to the, the Lord, the more things in this world bothers me. The more things that I tolerate in my life bothers me. The world would have that old saying from the 70s, don't worry, be happy to be our theme. But you know, if you're, if you're not saved, you have a lot to be concerned about. Come to the Savior today. And if you're the Lord's, walk close to Him. Um, what I've seen in the last few years, and we all can testify to this, it doesn't take a slippery slope, about one step, and Satan will suck you right away. The battle is real. The battle is real. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, this morning I sense in my own soul that I need to be closer in my walk with thee. I thank you, Father, for your word and for the Holy Spirit that will guide us and direct us in every way. Father, I pray for any who <clears throat> might be in the sound of my voice who doesn't know your Son is their Savior, that today they'll fall on their knees before you and repent of their sin and be saved. Accept Christ and what he done there on the cross and his resurrection to be their Savior. And for us who are thine, Father, we just pray that we would walk close to you and to one another so much more as we see that day approaching. Guide us, direct us, bring us back here this evening to hear your word once again. In Jesus' name.